Assam has got some of the best national parks of of the world, not only in India, Manas and as well as Kaziranga. There are other neglected areas like Dibru Sekwa, which not of, not many people know. Dibru Sekwa is as good as uh, as Kaziranga, possibly. No, I won't say better. So it's not right to, for me to compare, but certainly it is. It can stand out on its own. Similarly, we have or Orang National Park and many other places uh, which we, which are almost neglected. So when I was in the Ministry of Environment and Forest, <coughs> they used to call me the father of the neglected species of the neglected ecosystems, uh, because in Ministry of Environment and Forest, uh, tiger and tiger conservation is the end product. If you save tiger, you save everything, which is not correct. And many times I jokingly said that it is not a Ministry of Environment and Forest, it is a Tiger Ministry of India. Because 80% of the time, discussion is on tiger, kaise bachana hai. So I am not saying I am, we are against tiger, it is one of the most glorious animals of the world. But certainly we have to look beyond tiger. Because if we, are, if we talk about biodiversity, tiger is just a small part of the biodiversity. And you, you, most of you are biologists, I'm sure. And so you will understand the biodiversity also means spiders, orchids, insects, and everything connected with that in the whole ecosystem. So I have been uh, 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 sort of a bringing out the importance of the grasslands and the uh, and the wetlands. I mean, here we talk of wetland. Half of uh, Assam is wetland, <laughs> but I'm talking about the other parts of India also. The, why the wetlands are so important. And unfortunately, both these ecosystems are considered as wastelands in the technical term. In the official term, grassland is a wasteland. Wetland, when it is dry, it is a wasteland. That's why they give it to for development and all sorts of other activities. As you know, as a biologist, you know, there is no waste in nature. Everything is recycled at the molecular level. At every stage, it is right. There is no waste, except recently, when uh, it was, I'm just going to, uh, digressing, when, uh, you know, in Maharashtra they ban uh, polythene, uh, plastic bags. So polythene association said, we, we recycle 90% of the, uh, uh, you know, the plastic. I said, only 90%. Nature recycles 100%. <laughs> so the remaining 10% itself is a huge problem. They were thinking that, okay, we are recycling 90%, so the 10% is not an issue. So, and I gave a statement, is even 10% is a huge issue <laughs> that itself is creating. So, I will come back to this. Brahmaput floodplains are one of the most uh, productive floodplains. Flood plains. I won't say much about it. I uh, will change this. Uh, okay, I want to acknowledge Assam and others uh, and my volunteers, um, Taksh, Abdul Rahman and Muhammad and others who who come, who came with me and who helped me in in uh, in various uh, studies and wildlife institute for preparing the maps because i don't know much of her this is a brahmaputra this is a very dynamic ecosystem i don't have to go into explain it too much to you because you all know and it keeps on changing and uh, it, is, it is an aerial photograph. Not many people have seen the Brahmaput from, the, uh, from this angle because it, is, it looks glorious. And when you see this, it is the temporariness of the, some of the islands because every year the island changes. So if you have got a map, you prepare a map this year, the next year the, the island may not be there or maybe a much bigger island. And uh, I'll discuss about the, some of the species which are found in these islands or when they, they occupy these islands. And Brahmaput is the father of all rivers, not only in India. This is a picture of the uh, Kaziranga National Park. This is the aerial photograph of the aerial picture of the Kaziranga National Park. And you can see that 60% of Kaziranga, some say around 70% of Kaziranga is grassland and wetlands or wheels. Hmm. So this, and, and we, it has to be maintained like that. Most of the people say it's a fury of flood. I think it is a very stupid statement to say fury of flood. Flood is a part of the ecosystem. Flood, we are living in the, in the flood plains. We have, it's, it's our stupidity that we are living in the flood. flood. Flood should take place. Brahmaput floods and the Gangetic flood plains are enriched every year by the floods. So the flood is a equal, I mean, a very important part of the uh, Brahmaput river system as well as many other river systems. So we are talking about the Brahmaput floodplains. 
uh, there are nearly 890 species of birds in Assam uh, around, uh, that's what I say, uh, probably one or two will be added in a few years' time. Then the grassland birds, I, what I consider is nearly 70 species are grassland obligate birds. Obligate birds are around 35, which cannot live anywhere else. There are uh, uh, birds which live in the crop fields or, or, or they, are, they use the grasslands, but there are 35 or 40 species which cannot live anywhere else. And these uh, the grasslands of the Brahma flood plains are extremely important for them. And out of which nearly 13 to 14 now, the number has increased to 13 to 14 species are globally threatened. And other species are not doing very well, but uh, I, I, they have not yet come to the red list of the, of the, of the um, uh, IUCN. And near endemic to endemic are 10, uh, which are, I'll talk about them. These are the globally threatened bird species which are found in the uh, pallid harrier is a near threatened, Psalm Franklin vulnerable, and Bengal falcon critically endangered, and then uh, the others uh, you can you can make out. These are the birds which are totally dependent on the grasslands, and uh, not one type of grasslands, but various types of grasslands. I'll talk about that later. It's not that when you are talking of grassland, when talking of forest, it's just not one forest because if you see champion and set, uh, there are nearly. 30 to 35 major types of forest and then there are subdivisions of the forest and champion said the whole book is about the forest cover of India. Similarly, there should be a book on the grassland cover of India. There was a Debadga and uh, Shankar Narayan's book in 1973, uh, grass, grass cover of India, but we, it has to be revised. They have, uh, they have also categorized grasslands into various categories and sub, sub, sub categories. So, uh, this, the similarly, these birds, some, some birds live in two or three types of grasslands, some birds are specific to one type of grasslands, so I'll talk about that later. <coughs> species are uh, studied. You, you see around 15 species are there in the grassland, threatened birds, uh, and there are 70, but very few study, studies have been done, except for the Bengal falcon. Swamp Franklin, we have done BNHS, I have done studies, one of my students has done studies on the Swamp Franklin, Yellow Weaver, BNHS has done, Yellow Breasted Bunting, recent studies in China as well as in India is going on, and, and for other, the practical nothing is known. They are there, what Salim Ali, Ali and Ripley have written in the Handbook of the Birds of India and Pakistan, that is the Bible, the people think that is the end of the research. No, that is the starting of the research. We still have to do, learn so much about these birds, which we do not know. Uh, so, I can change it like this only. I'll, I'll just briefly talk about the, the king of the grasslands, avian king of the grass, which is the Bengal flocking. It is known as the Bengal flocking, but it is extinct in Bengal. So, now we should call it the Assam flocking, because it is mainly found in Assam. Uh, so, uh, we have done studies uh, when I came in 1984 for the first time, I came in search of this bird. So, and we found in few places. And um, we highlighted the species. Work is also done by RNK, which is based in Guwahati. They have also done and um, uh, major projects. Uh, we, uh, we had a major uh, project in 2013 and 2016. I have got a uh, final copy of, the, of this uh, uh, project, I would like to give it to, to your uh, So, I brought, and work in Kaziranga and Chapuri. Chapuri is the uh, islands, which you can see, this is the Chapuri. And these are the islands, so which we have done some work on this, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. So, the basic information about the Bengal falcon is that it is commonly known as charas or cattle, and here in it is known as Ullu Mora. Ullu is a uh, is a grass huh? and mora is peacock G peacock us grass ka peacock is ullu mora so uh, that and this large bird of the domestic hen it is of this size this size size the female is slightly higher and is thinner you can see that this is a female male is very conspicuous because it is uh, territorial as well as ad ad advertises itself and uh, is mainly black and white so in a green grass and with the clouds on the background, when it jumps, so it becomes very conspicuous and very uh, sexy for the female. And the, they are, they, they have their territories, they, what we call it is a lex. They come back to the same place again and again and again and again. So there are some sites which we have been monitoring for the last 40 years. The Bengal falcon 
seen in the same spot, not necessarily the same bird, uh, same individual, but as soon, as soon as one individual dies, it is the territory is occupied by another one. So the territories are at premium. The females roam around in larger area, and then they select the best males among them for mating purpose. And the selection is decided on the on the size as well as that how it displays. I don't have a picture of the display, but it jumps above the grass and then. So that this is the way they 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 are made, and this is the basic thing which we know of. Uh, <coughs> Open grasslands are their preferred habitat. They don't live in very tall grass. So within the grassland ecosystem, within in Kaziranga, within in Manas, and within in Orang and other places, you have uh, uh, the grasslands where the rhinos are found, where the grasslands where the swamp deers are found, where the buffaloes graze. So they live in a slightly higher grassland, which, which gets flooded in a very uh, when it's really flo a major flood, but not, does not remain. The water is not retained. So they 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 basically they are bustards. Florkins are also they belong to bustards. Bustards are basically dryland species. So they, within the ecosystem, they prefer those grasslands which are known as the Damara grasslands in some places, and Imperita cylindrica, Ullumora. So that is uh, the preferred habitat in the sense that we have wherever we have found we found them in the because Ullumora remains short for a very long time. Now with the monsoon, it grows very tall. But most of the time it remains short and they prefer the short grass plains. Uh, and then for, for nesting purpose, males are very regularly seen. So that's why in the last uh, 2014 16 surveys, we found 112 adult males, territorial males in India. Not many. So we would think there will be thousands of them, or there are not many. So there could be many more in the sense there are probably 100 more because we could not locate it. But these are the sites which in, in Manas we found 32 adult territorial males. There could be many, a few more, so, but not in hundreds. And, and uh, the, the, we do not know ecology of the female birds. Where does it nest? Nothing is known. We know that from the olden days that they lay three to four eggs, sometimes two, two to three eggs on the ground because they are terrestrial birds, they, they don't live, uh, sit on the trees. And, but beyond that, we uh, not, uh, not much is known about it. So we, um, in the Dudwa National Park, unfortunately we couldn't get permission in Assam, but in the Dudwa National Park we put the PTT and we got remarkable results uh, to know where do they go, how, how long do they go, where do they live, what type of habitat they prefer. So these are the studies we ha which have been done in the, in, uh, in, on, on Bengal Falcon. In the Indian subcontinent, it occurs in India and Nepal, they are in Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, and Lower Arunachal Pradesh. These are the four states where it is found. But there is another subspecies which is found in Cambodia and Vietnam. Vietnam it is extinct, but now there are a few, probably 500 to 600 are surviving in Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, so, and this, this, uh, okay. This used to be the distribution of the Bengal fork. And all, you see from Uttar Pradesh to almost the whole of uh, Bhutan and the war. But now they are all in patches. I'll show you the. This is the distribution now, just in few patches. Uh, uh, pro, pro, uh, this is mainly in the Brahmaput flood plains. These are the places where we have located the Bengal falcon. Uh, Manas, uh, yeah, this is this is Kaziranga, and we have not shown Manas is here, and Orang, Bura Chapori, and then there are the, these are the Chapori's. We did the Brahmaput survey. And then this is a area, another area where the Bengal falcons are found in the ring, and we have found on this area also. So these are you, you can see how 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 fragmented the distribution is. But fortunately, the bird is a strong flyer, so possibly they are, there is an intermixing of the population, and certainly there is an intermixing of the population here within this group. This is Sadia Plains, and there also this 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 group, and then there is another one here in Manas. So that is a. Uh, Mm, okay. So we have given a uh, lot of recommendations based on our surveys, uh, based on research, but that uh, we, we still need much, much better studies, particularly with the PTT, particularly with the genetic studies, to find out whether there is a, the genetic mixing of the population, which we do not know at present, and whether they are isolated from each other, and what is happening when they go, uh, when, the, when, the, when the flood comes and they go out of the protected area. So there we have given a lot of recommendations. I won't go into the detail of this. Uh, uh, these are the recommendations. Then, now, Manipur bush quail. There is another bird 
which is known as the Bis Manipur Bush Square. The last time it was seen is in 1935. <laughs> 1935. In 2006, Anwaruddin Chaudhary, who is one of the best uh, uh, naturalists of, uh, famous naturalists of, of uh, not in Assam, uh, not of, only of Assam, but for India. So he has seen it in Manas, and then uh, there was one uh, unconfirmed record from Nagaland, Mini, uh, by Peter Lobo. So that is the only thing. So we keep on doing research on tiger and monitoring a leopard and leopard, and there are species which are disappearing from that. So when I gave my representation to the bird life in IUCN, they have uplisted this species from uh, almost neglected. Because people, people all thought that it, is, it may still be there. No one is looking at it. But uh, we need a full-fledged study. And where are the research students from Cotton College? Or, or they should, someone, someone, anyone from Manipur? Ah, sir, your, your job is to find this bird. <laughs> in a few years' time, we should be giving a lecture on the ecology of the Manipur bush quail. This is uh, almost gone. Uh, it is one of the, possibly in a few years' time, we have to declare that it is extinct. Uh, so, <clears throat> this was the distribution, earlier distribution you can see. It was never very abundant. It was never, even 100 years ago, it was uncommon bird. But it used to be present there. But now we have only two or three records. And most of these records are unconfirmed. They are just fleeting records. No one has photographed it. No one has collected a feather. So one thing which you can also do is that you can collect the feathers of the quail. First, you have to know the habitat and go there and collect feathers and find out from the genetic study whether the bird is still there. There are museum specimens. So we can do your comparison and find out whether the bird is still exists because it lives in short grass plains or short grasses dense short grasses and is re very re reluctant to come out so in the olden days they used to hunt it with the dogs they will in the Brit british period they will there's most of them are hunting records because they have collected the specimens from these areas so uh, for manipur bush quail we also also we have given we want a full fledged study on the manipur bush quail not only just uh, just first study has to be search go and search it possibly it will take one year to just find out you uh, Someone, no one is looking at it. So possibly, it, it won't be common, but it's possibly it is it's still surviving in some areas. So that's why I So, and once we find the, that, it, uh, one, that it is still there in some places, then possibly a full-fledged study, PhD study, or some sort of study can be done uh, on the Manipur bush quail. And, and, and hmm. ah, this is, okay, this is. Black-breasted parrot bird. This is one of my one of my favorite birds, and I would like for someone to do. I would I would like to guide a PhD student for this bird. And I'll talk. I'll talk it later also about it. Why it is so interesting, and you please note it down with some of the characters. Why it is interesting because in the, in the for thesis you have to have some questions, and these birds give me a lot of questions. I'm still not able to understand what it is ecology. It is known as a parrot bill because its bill is like a parrot. You can see it is a small bird with a bill like a parrot. It nibbles. It lives in null grass, Arundodonex and Phragmitis carca. Those are the, uh, these are the two grasses in which it is mainly found. But I could be wrong. You, someone is, if you are doing detailed study, possibly you can say that it is found in some other places also. But it is a very interesting bird. It is uh, now it is considered as an endangered species. It is listed in the um, IUCN. There are <clears throat> full fledged, as I said, the full fledged, genet uh, genetic study should also be done to find out the, um, whether they are isolated. I'll show, show you this. Uh, later, I'll show you uh, why. Sorry, I'm mixing it up. Uh, there are two things coming up. So I'm sometimes I'm two, two, I can see two, two slides at the same time. Anyway, black breasted parrot bill, I would like to, someone to do detailed study in Manas, Kaziranga. And recently, I've just came, I'm coming back from Arunachal, where I have found two more populations of the black-breasted parrot, fairly good populations of the black-breasted parrot bill. We also would like to do a study on the harvesting of the null grass. Null grass is very important. So what is the impact of the harvesting on the? Because it, it is totally dependent on the null grass. So what happens? So how can we, how can we you know, uh, manage this? harvesting process or what is what should be the what time the null grass should be harvested these are things which need to be studied before we can give any recommendation at present these are all my preliminary observations based on my uh, uh, see, you know field field studies 
hidden and lost. There is a small bird known as swamp rhenia. Now, this is also had been uplisted on based on my recommendation by the IUCN. It lives in vitivaria grass, <laughs> which is very thin grass, and and it lives in there, nowhere else. So again, it has widely, widely, uh, you know, very uh, fragmentary distributed. Wherever you have vitivaria, wherever you get, only the, only then it will be found within the grassland ecosystem. So. The birds are living in a different type of grassland ecosystems. And again, I, I don't have any picture. This is a picture I have taken it from my friend. And can you see it? <laughs> no, it's pointing out in the middle, but this is the type of it. This is a challenge for a researcher. We can study it. I mean, it's not necessary you have to study this behavior, but ecology can be studied if you, if, if you, if we give time to it. And if you know that, and once you start studying that the bird is not so difficult to observe or, and uh, get more information about it. Now, <clears throat> it has got two subpopulations. Earlier, now, no, earlier it was known as a subspecies. Now there are two subspecies, or full species, Rufus vented and Swamprenia. Rufus vented prenia and Swamprenia. Rufus vented prenia is on the no, no, western side, Sindh River as well as the Punjab Rivers. And Swamprenia is in the Brahmaput floodplains rivers. Now, it is not even a prenia. The recent genetic studies say, uh, say it is a wobbler. <laughs> so, it is totally, it is now dis, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, taxonomically separated. So, it is a qu quite interesting bird to uh, study. So, we want to know the, what are the exact habitat requirements now of this swamp prenia. So, we can create these habitats for the bird if in such, certain areas. It is not uh, uh, difficult to create these habitats. We found it in Deering and Kaziranga also and a few other places. So this, this is the distribution of the sample. Yeah, you can see uh, okay, uh, this is the one here, one here, here, and here. And, and here. So this is a weak flyer. It is a small bird. It lives in a particular. So it is so much fragmented. So it is a very interesting study to do the genetic studies of these, whether they are related or whether they are fragmented for how long. And one more thing which you have to, we have also have to study the age of the grasslands because it's colonization, they are weak colonizers. So even if you build a grassland or if your grassland comes up, the bird, may, the source population may not be there or the source population may be so far away, they will not colonize it. So we also, I am also taking a, a data on the age of the grass, how long is the grassland, how old is the grassland. Uh, so, these are all interesting studies for researchers to take up as a PhD topic instead of everyone is studying the um, elephant conflict and something like that, human and flip on. Actually, this, and, uh, and last, my last word, word is not last word, but in the, for, to give example, is a yellow weaver. Again, yellow weaver is a very, uh, this is the last bird to be, a weaver to be discovered. Is found in India, Nepal, and used to be present in Bangladesh. This is the, these are the only three countries. Where the Bangladesh possibly it is extinct, but now it is a small population is found in Nepal and India. Hmm. Again, people think, oh, it's widely distributed. It should be there. But when you, one of my research student did the research, when he went there, now he found that in the last, uh, this, this year's result, that a small isolated population are present in 35 areas, just 35, not in the continuous belt like that we used to be present. And sometimes the population is five birds, then 10 birds or 15 birds. Sukla Panta is the only place where you have got probably 100 uh, yellow weavers. The biggest population is uh, used to be. So, it, and interestingly, this bird, unlike the other birds, which try to hide their eggs, uh, nests, it build the nest on top of the tree, like, oh, sorry, oh, just a minute, I was talking something, because I get two, two, two slides here, so I think, you can see this. It built the nest on top of the trees, huh? and removed the, most of the uh, leaves. So the nest is quite conspicuous, but the protection of the nest is through the numbers. So they mob anyone which comes. And sometimes they also have got a drongo nesting below. The drongo is a bird which chases away all the other birds. So the, they get the secondary support from the drongo. Drongo is known as jungle kotwal. Like a kotwal can take care of. Sometimes they steal you also, but then they take care of you. So similarly, they, they also nest uh, with the jungle kotwal. But the, the number is the main important thing. 
in the olden days in the former days when the when the before the human impact they were uh, you know almost sea of grass and in between there will be two or three semal trees from bombay ciba or some other trees where the, these birds will be nesting there won't be many crows there because in in forest you don't get crows its crows are generally commensal with human being when human being settle the crows also come with them in the natural forest there are not many crows particularly the house crows are not there the jungle crows are there but sort of not there. but now people are everywhere with them the crows are everywhere hey when the crows are in bigger numbers then they destroy there is a uh, my, one of my students in uh, uttarakhand saw a nesting colony of i think 20 uh, nests and a flock of crow came and destroyed all the nests because the number was less the, their number was less so the there was a critical number through which they could defend their nests they will mob it and then chase it away like that and moreover but now the critical number has gone so one crow can destroy all the nests <laughs> so such type of this is this is again a, a topic for some phd student to do research to do it what is the impact or second impact of these uh, predators and these predators have come because of human being and they are not present in natural ecosystem or not in that number when they used to be there. now they are they are everywhere so and you can see that earlier just a minute second there are two sub species of this uh, yellow weaver one was in the um, one was on the western india uh, uttar pradesh uttarakhand and other places and nepal and then the other one was east india there are some records from calcutta but possibly they are escape birds because it was traded so sometimes they escape and people locate it and like that and there are one or two records this is a question mark because possibly it is the wrong record so there are two species so so again this is another bird which needs uh, detailed research on the, on the. Yeah. and rec- the, then there is uh, the yellow uh, cylinder bill babbler is one bird which is fairly common i i found it and then we have to probably i won't say downlist it but at least uh, we have to think about its uh, status as we found it again this is also a endemic to the northeast cylinder bill babbler is endemic you find only in this area in the whole world nowhere else there you got from myanmar but there are if you are it's still here and then we have got the marsh babbler gone with the marshes because it lives in the marsh as i said that the, the i'm talking about grassland there are different types of grass this bird lives in the mar, in the grassland or the marshes with the standing water so you have to go in, go in kichad <laughs> you can if you want to study this bird because it mainly found wherever we found it was in the marsh area and we could locate it only through the so so, so i started with the bird which lives in the slightly dry areas is ending with the marshes so what is this there are many other birds uh, there is another bird which is known as the white throated bush chat which is a migrant in uh, and i have seen it only twice again it comes to Uh, northeast in uh, use uh, but we still do not know the status it breeds in a very small area in mongolia and from mongolia it comes to india so we can study its movement we can study its ecology uh, uh, possibly winter ecology in there uh, now this this please uh, give attention to this distribution and vis a vis habitat in the olden days or the old book books handbook of the birds of india which came out in 19 the first volume came out in 1969 and the last came out in 1974 so it is only 45 years old you they, they write salimali writes i can read it here uh, about the black breasted parrot bird resident scarce in the hills locally common in the plains eh? no more common <laughs> and and from east nepal two specimens of the british museum east along the foothills through the darjeeling sikkim bhutan and nepal at that time because it is old discovered nepal now and the mishmi hill the plains of upper assam and there now this description is outdated <coughs> so because most of the places the habitat is not there this was this was written nearly 50 years ago or based on 150 or 100 years old description by the british you baker another same thing is being repeated in rasmussen and anderton which came out the book came out in 2012 so 
we need more research to find out what is the actual habitat or the status of these birds. So we can't go back on the old distribution record. Like my, one of my students did his PhD on the Nirgi laughing thrush. And uh, please listen, Nirgi laughing thrush is found in the Nilgiris. Nilgiris in the Western Himalaya, uh, Western Ghats. Nilgiris is around 5,000 square kilometer. So in a map, you see distribution of Nil in the Nilgiris. So you are, are it's, it's probably 5,000 square kilometer. So it must be common there. Uh, no, don't, we don't have to worry. So what he did is, he, he, his PhD, he found that the bird is found only 1700, above 1,700 meters. So half of Nilgiri is not its habitat. <laughs> so you've got only 2,500 to 2,400 square kilometer area. Within this 2,400 square kilometer, it is found only in the, in the Shola forest. So he made the map of the Shola forest, which is distributed in the Nilgiris. And all the maps, I mean, he did the digital mapping. He, he, he went to the, to the field, to actual view. And how we got the... <laughs> so he, uh, then he did the mapping and he found that the total area of the Nilgi laughing thrush is a 200, 210 square kilometer. <laughs> the area of occupancy or the or the habitat available and area of occupancy is certainly less and the biggest shola grassland patch shola forest patch was 17 square kilometer and some were only half a square kilometer so distribution and occupancy and old distribution and you know habitat they it has to be for most of the species it for many species not it has to be worked out so you, we, we, we are feeling that, okay, the bird should be still there. But when you start doing their work, you find this is, they are missing from most of the places. So same thing is the, there is a habit, distribution versus habitat. You see this map. Bristle grass bird is still so widely distributed. This is a classical map, the map from a book. Hmm. Now, if someone does start working on this, then we'll know the actual distribution because this, is, this map is based on old records, sometimes 150 years old records, all the collated records. So we need, for many species, we need to people to work on it. Same thing with the yellow weaver, as I told you this. this look. Uh, as I said, that within the habitat, how much is occupied by the so this is also another topic for PhD or, or researchers to do it. What is the occupancy of the, of the how much habitat? Like in Manas National Park, our, in Kaziranga is Manas, we know nearly 65% of Kaziranga is grassland. And uh, Kaziranga is around 1100 square kilometer, including the sixth edition. So almost 600 to 700 square kilometer is grassland. Hmm. But the Bengal falcon is not found in all the grass areas. So the occupancy is much, much less than what it should be there from what it looks like in the, in the distribution records or people will think about it. So for this, we need to do proper habitat research on the, or the habitat requirement of these birds. Now you see the parrot bills. As I said, I, I didn't show the picture. Parrot bill is found here, and I found it recently. I just it's not added here. This 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 year I found it two two places here. Then there is a Dibru Sakwa. This is a Deering Sanctuary. Then we come to Kaziranga, and then we have got Loktak Lake in Manipur and Manas in. And then the, this is the nearest. Nearest is around 50 square kilometer distribution between the two habitats. So this is all one complex, but this is. Between this and this is probably 50, 60 square kilometers. And here it is nearly 200 square kilometers, not square kilometers, 200 kilometers, some of the distances. In between, there could be some areas. I am not saying that, uh, I have not seen it. I, have, I don't know. The, the maps, do, uh, I mean, digital maps do not show the type of grasslands which, in which this bird lives. So this is totally fragmented. From there. Earlier, if you see the record, if you see the distribution, it is found in the Brahmaput flood plains, even up to West Bengal it was reported. So <laughs> the actual situation is certainly much worse than what it shows. 
One issue which needs very good research and long-term research is the burning issue. And I'm very happy that Dr. Dr. Narayan is with, with us here. He did his PhD on the Bengal falcon in Manas. And of course, now he's famous for his pygmy hawk work. And uh, from the last 35 years, we are saying that we need long-term research on the grass burning. What should be the exact uh, time? and How much it should be burned? What should be the burning pattern? What uh, the patches or whatever, whether you burn the whole every year, and what is the impact of the grass burning? The grass bur burning is a natural process of many of the grasslands. So they, they are maintained by burning, but not every year burning, but not by regular burning, not by the burning which is done intensively. And grass burning is mainly done in, in context of the larger mammals. So the rhino can be seen and the, uh, the new grass will come up, so the swamp deer will be there. So we are not against that, that sort of a thing. Was, yes, yes, we should do it. But no one gives attention to the burning. So the, we, what we had recommended based on our research, and uh, Gautam can verify and you can also discuss it with him, that burning should be finished by early uh, by January, end of January, or certainly but before 15th February, it should be over. Sometimes the money comes in March. They say, we can burn only in March <laughs> because paisa nahi tha. When the March is the breeding season of these birds and they bird, they nest in the, in the, in the grasses. So the, their nest and the eggs and chicks are also burned in there. So that sort of, we want to study. And then not only the birds, but a lot of reptiles and um, turtles are also burned. So we want to know the impact of this burning. There is a very good topic to do, a long-term research on the impact of the annual burning, which is taking place in the, as, as a part of the management of this most of these sanctuaries. Another issue is a very dangerous one is IS. Hmm. More dangerous than the babus, eh? I will say. Invasive alien species, not the IS officers, I'm talking about the invasive alien species which is also a very huge topic these days. And there should, be a, uh, there should be regular studies on such type of things because newer and newer invasive species are coming up. Which we, the, the, the species which we have not seen 30 years ago, now they are regularly seen uh, there. So, and what is the impact? There could be positive impact also for some species. There could be negative impact for most of the species because they are aliens. They are, they are not from here, from India, from there. Yeah. So that is one thing which we have to uh, do and which, which is another uh, interesting PhD topic for people to take it up instead of just going for leopard ecology and tiger ecology. You take up new things which, will, uh, which, which are more exciting. Now, this is study which we know, this is no place for computer nerds. You have to leave your mobile, not leave your mobile, I mean, not literally, but certainly you have to be in the field. You can see from these pictures you have to be standing, sometimes standing in the water to take the observation or get down from the boats and you have to, so it is not only for, it is not for what I call is only for the people who cannot live without, uh, without their mobile. You have to, sometimes you have to leave it there and you will find it more exciting. Sometimes you have to live in the places like this for, for a week or sometimes for 10 days. And if you are doing research, you live for three years on this. There's nothing wrong in that. <laughs> hmm. And not for internet and face, Facebook. There are a lot of Facebook biologists these days. They'll take a picture and then suddenly it will be, their picture will be on the Facebook and then wow, 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 wow. everyone claps and then nothing happens after that. That does not contribute to science. Hmm. These are some pictures taken from the field, exact field, field research. Be ready for all modes of transport. Hmm. Uh, even the tractor, in many places you have to walk. Sometimes we have, I walked 18 kilometers uh, in during sanctuary because there is no transport. 18, 22 kilometers every day was nothing. Uh, and boats, most of these islands are, uh, you know, uh, the chapuris or most of places. You have to use the boat. And most boats are not very fancy boats. They are very rickety. So uh, it's always, so you must, you must learn swimming. If you want to do research in grasslands, you should learn swimming. Okay, <laughs> I don't know actually. <laughs> the, there are a lot of difficulties. Permission to work in PAs, lahe lahe, everything is in lahe lahe here. Yeah. Takes sometimes two years to get permission. <laughs> so you should be re ready for that. Rainfall and floods are also a very important factor. These, these factors are not present in other states. 
on other areas. Rainfall is such a huge factor that for six six months you can't do work here, or or particularly also all over four or five months people still do it. Logistic uh, remote areas sometimes no place to stay overnight. There are a lot of places where are wonderful. That's why they are wonderful because there is no place to stay overnight. So the daring sanctuary is wonderful because there is no road. You have to go by boat and then you have to walk. So it is one of the finest sanctuaries left in India. But that is boarding, lodging, and then limited food: rice, dal, dal, rice, rice, dal. Something like that. You have to eat for three, for months together. <laughs> you just three dishes. I need three, na? No, they go count. Karo three. <laughs> and then you have to walk with them. Always danger. In one place in Deering, we were not allowed to go there because there was a tusker. He has killed nine people. He <laughs> said, "I don't want to be the, become the tenth one." <laughs> and but it is also fun to be because you're 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 always on your nerves kahin se buffalo na jaye kahin se tiger to tiger is not a huge problem but this rhino and buffalo are really a big problem with that some places but this is also fun i would say is always the one of the they are, they are one of the best creatures of the world now academic challenging questions about the so I, i have challenging questions for all the species but i'm just taking one species and this this is the Brahmaputra grasslands are dynamic and change in time and space, as you can see. Hmm. Every few years, there will be a new flooding, and so new grass will develop, and uh, other uh, sands will sand will come up. Then the succession will take place. Some uh, uh, colonizers will come, and after that, the, uh, then grass composition also changes depending on the. I have seen one island which is totally now different from uh, the grasses because of the sand which came up. So. some birds are grass specific there is a question mark because i am not 100% sure but it looks like they are they, they are grass grass particular grass specific as you can see they are sedentary and weak flyers are they again a question because in science you should always have questions so you cannot say that with 100% surety they look like weak flyers and but possibly they can also if there is if they have to if they hard press they probably they can fly for 200 km we do not know but It, uh, it seems unlikely how do they cope up with the ever changing habitat they are specific to a particular grass the grass is not specific for a long time they know that eh? so how how they became so habitat specialist and are they really habitat specialist or this is just just uh, we think of them possibly they are much more adaptable so how do they colonize new chaporis like this one hmm how do how do they cross these rivers i mean this may not be a very long or big one but for samprenia possibly it is a barrier between the two now if, if a samprenia is found here if samprenia and then after two years if this island disappears where will the samprenia go of course they can colonize this which is very nearby but if they if the su habitat suitable habitat is not present there then what will happen to the samprenia so these are all questions which can which can come up for the Uh, good researchers now and, and how will they cope up with the climate change which we still do not know this is another way. possibly dst can give a good project on the impact of the climate change of the grassland birds of the brahmaputra flood plain this is, can be a very interesting topic for them because climate change is now everything like tiger earlier now climate a lot of money in climate change yeah. cope up, and then uh, can we protect them in fragmented grassland this is another question what administrative interventions are required that whether we have we can create them we can modify them whatever is there. and what will be the impact of the large dams on these we still do not know these are all open questions of of the brahmaputra flood plains no one talks about this change okay now last coming back to the parrot bill why parrot bills have bills like parrot hmm <laughs> this is i would certainly would like someone to take up the is a is a challenging topic see they are found 10 species are found these are all parrot bills supposed to feed on grass seeds really because in olden literature is no one has seen them feeding on the grass possibly they are feeding on grass but like a parrot i have seen them nibbling parrot 
parrot feeds on high nutritious food and many times it drops also we feeds on fruits and other things and nectar and lot of other things it drops it but it feeds parrot bill lives in a in the in the in the arundodonax and i have seen them eating pith of the arundodonax i have got a picture i have got a small video clip the pith is not very nutritious someone has to do the study of the nutritive value of the pith whether they are really feeding on that whole time or they are this is just one part of the food of the, uh, one item of the food so this is another thing do they feed like parrot cut and nibble and and do they feed on hidden insects within that so this is also uh, no. so we have to do not not gut analysis but at least we fecal analysis to find out whether they are feeding only on the grasses or uh, which is yeah, or the se- seeds or the grubs which are present there so these are this is very interesting topic for for a phd student to take it up summary i have already spoken we should have more attention to the grasslands habitats of the brahmaputra plains develop methodology and train people to study them because it is not a very easy study i have to always take volunteers particularly a person like abid abir rahman who is one of the finest bird watchers of here yeah, because you have to do call playback you may go there you will stay there for many you won't see a bird so with the call playback we have to see we have to develop a methodology to find out what is the density of the grass or of the bird what is the distribution of those birds and which bird is which the, um, among those birds which i mentioned is found in which grasslands whether they are specific to arundodonax and phragmites or they are also found in vitivaria uh, or sacrum munja so we have to see all these things associations so you have to so you have to study the Uh, the botany of the of the grasslands and their presence and absence of the grass sometimes absence data is also very important you find a habitat but the bird is not there so why it is not there so this is another question which we have to answer there and work with the forest department volunteers this is develop independent projects as i said on on these collect information on all the grassland birds i have already mentioned these are the these are the candidate species 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 phds <laughs> okay so the student should take it up hmm. genetic studies on all the birds of these to find out whether the what is what is the impact of the fragmentation and how long they have been fragmented and whether whether we can remove this what i call it is assisted migration assisted migration is then we transport some individual from one population to another because we like uh, so we possibly in future we have to do this because we can't be isolating birds like this so in future possibly and also give special attention to debru sacco biosphere reserve or deering sanctuary and extensive flood plains are present the chapor is a lohit i just came back from lohit siang and dibang rivers we are which needs much more extensive surveys we are with my limited time and budget everything other commitments i can't do the but we need some researchers to take up this and do extensive surveys to find out possibly there amarpur grassland is a very good grassland we found and then there are many other grasslands which can be studied <coughs> study the impact of the large dams because the large dams what is going to happen i think i have to tell you that they will retain the water for 18 hours and then they release it so you will have flood and drought flood and drought daily not not annual and if we, there are 300 dams doing the same thing so just see the impact of the change of the water regime so at present the water flows if there is annual flooding hmm but here throughout the year they will be flooding or so what will be the impact? how the grasses will react to this sort of a flooding and and dryness daily basis so this this is one thing which we need to study thank you very much sir